Welcome to How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, the stories behind the people driving results in the nonprofit sector. I love running a business, maybe more than even doing the services. That's been sort of an unexpected a discovery about myself, which has been a really cool thing to learn and to have happen. Amy Varga is the president of the Varga Group. We discuss her background as a fundraiser and a university professor to future fundraisers. We also dive into how she determined what services to offer and how to create a successful and profitable consultancy. Amy is a very thoughtful business owner and she shares some invaluable information for those looking to start your own business. A quick announcement. As a listener of the podcast, we are making the Engagement Fundraising Audiobook available to you free of charge. Just go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. As a thank you for listening, we wanted to give everyone free access to Greg's Engagement Fundraising Audiobook that you can get on Audible or Apple Books for $15. Once again, just visit imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. That's imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and we hope you enjoy Greg's book. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Amy Varga. Thanks for having me. First off, can you introduce yourself and the Varga Group? Sure. Um, I'm Amy Varga. I'm the president of the Varga Group. We specialize in capital campaigns, fundraising training, and facilitating retreats. We also occasionally take on a limited number of executive coaching clients And one fun thing is that we have a handful of loyal corporations who bring us in to train their employees on how to be great board members. 2019 will be our sixth year in business, although we did start consulting and teaching on the side, or I did, in 2008. So how did you develop the list of offerings that your company uh, provides to nonprofits? I always like to tell people that, just like probably lots of small businesses, The first few years, this is how we did that. When somebody said, what do you do? My answer was, what do you need? (laughs) (laughs) So it was really about, you know, I knew I wanted to do fundraising and board development. You know, looking back, I really didn't know what that meant. And so it's taken, you know, the past six years to refine which offerings I wanted to niche in on. And I did that by looking at which things were most profitable which things were most needed in my sort of geographic wish area and what I enjoyed doing the most. So something that I've been hearing already is board development being such a passion of yours. Did you have prior experience with bad boards that led you to want to help nonprofits do better in that area? You know, really, it's the opposite. For the first 18 years of my career, I worked in nonprofits and in higher education, and I loved board members. And so what I noticed around me was that so many people were doing a lot of board bashing is what I called it yeah, and complaining. And I love board members. I just think that people who step up to serve their community and to make a difference who are not being paid to do so are just the real heroes in our communities. And I want to champion that. So really, it was the opposite. I love board members, and I wanted to help them be the best board members that they could be. So prior to starting your business, you taught students about nonprofit fundraising in a university setting. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? And what were some of your favorite topics to discuss in that environment. That was really my entree into into making the shift from working for organizations into consulting. And so while I was working in the last organization I was working in, I was a higher education institution, I reached out to my local community college originally and asked them if they would be interested in me developing a certificate program around nonprofit fundraising. And they were receptive to it. And so I did that. It's still running Portland Community College. I haven't taught in it for several years now, but that was a really wonderful experience. And that led to helping another uh, certificate program that's still running and it's in its sixth year here in Portland and also teaching at the University of Portland's business school and Portland State's Master's in Public Administration's program. So there was a while, if you were taking a graduate-level fundraising class in Portland, you were taking it from me. 
And that was a really fun time for me. And what was the style of the classes? Was it lecture and they're just sitting and listening or was it more of a dialogue? Oh, man. Again, just like I I was saying earlier about learning as I went, I think back to the first classes I taught and what a crappy teacher I was. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that teaching originally, like many people, and really what has taught me a lot about how to be a great consultant too is so many of us think that teaching and consulting is about being the expert and giving as much information as we can. And really what shifted my mind was a book called How to Teach Adults. The kind of core tenet of that is that you're not teaching anyone anything, that you're helping facilitate someone learning something. And so that radically changed the way that I taught those classes and directly has influenced the way I do consulting. So I see myself as a facilitator and someone who helps people learn and grow, not as, you know, the expert who's teaching them something. And if you come at it from that point of view, it really makes you rethink the way that you do everything. So initially, yes, there was a lot of lecture and a lot of slides, and it changed over the years to pretty much no lecture and lots of experiential learning opportunities for those students. And you mentioned that you had around 18 years of experience in fundraising. What were some of the roles you held during those years? You bet. I mean, I started out as a development coordinator when I didn't even know what fundraising was. It was my first job. And like a lot of people, you kind of got thrown into the fire. I went on to be a major gift officer for Habitat for Humanity. I worked for a couple different higher education institutions, Santa Clara University, Willamette University, and Clackamas Community College were some of them. Okay. Were there any key takeaways that really stuck with you over the years? Fundraising is not about you. <laughs> it's about your donors. It's about your donors. People ask me a lot about, you know, why did you switch from working for someone to, to running your own thing? And one piece of that, an important piece of that, was that I deeply stopped caring where donors gave their money. And I cared a lot more about how they made the decision about where to give their money. And so, of course, when you're a fundraiser employed by some organization, you you do have to sort of care or try to influence that or at least connect with people around that issue. And I just stopped caring about that. That led me on a journey to figure out what do I do with that? You know, what job is that? So that led you to teaching and then to starting your own business, right? Yeah. I mean, I was teaching while I was working. And then essentially people started asking me, hey, can you do this on the side? You know, would you take on running this board retreat or would you coach me as a fundraiser? Those kinds of projects. Would you come in and train our board on fundraising? For several years, I thought maybe I should try to go out on my own. I had that kind of imposter syndrome thing going on for a while there where I thought, who am I to be a consultant? Who am I to be an expert in any of this? And then eventually I kind of got over that and decided to take the leap. Yeah. So what was that first year like of starting your own business? I can't untangle the first year of starting my business from what was going on in my personal life. The first year I started my business, I also had my second child. I had a two and a half year old and a newborn and a new business. And it was hard. <laughs> it was really <laughs> hard. It was sort of nuts, you know, looking back that I did it that way. But it also made me realize that grit and resilience and persistence and focus. Those are the things that I think entrepreneurs and people that launch out on their own that we need. And that was certainly a great training ground for that, you know, having all of that going on at the same time. But what was really cool was I loved it. You know, you sort of (laughs) don't know if you're going to like it. You think you might like it. Yeah. Still pinch myself every day that I get to do this. I love running a business, maybe more than even doing the services. That's been sort of an unexpected a discovery about myself, which has been a really cool thing to learn and to have happen. So what roles within running the business have you had to do quite a bit of learning on? I mean, everything from accounting to the taxes and um, 
managing your time, all that? Pretty much right away. I knew I didn't want to deal with the bookkeeping and taxes and all of that accounting element. So I outsourced that from the very beginning. I knew I didn't want to learn that basically, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I think the piece that I've had to learn the most is sort of the operational side of running a service-based business. It wasn't like I worked for a nonprofit and then I went and I worked for a large consulting firm, you know, and I sort of learned client services and also sort of the administrative aspect of running a firm or an agency. That stuff's what I've had to learn as I go and on the fly. So I would say figuring out how to do the financial analysis on what kinds of services and what level of profitability each one has, and then how to price my business expenses within the context of project-based work, incorporating that into my fees. Those would be some of the more complicated things. And I'm still figuring that all that out, but I've made a lot of headway in that. How long did it take you to become like financially independent where you felt comfortable I'm running my own business and this is my only source of income. I think I was really fortunate because I had lived and worked and served on boards. And then a lot of the teaching stuff, I had a giant network. My own personal style is a sort of network building style. So honestly, from year one, I was profitable and it's really grown faster than I I could have ever imagined. Do you have any past students that are now like clients of yours? Tons, tons and tons and tons of them. Yeah, that must be almost a fun relationship to have teaching them and when they were, you know, grad students and now seeing them in their Yeah, you know, like I mentioned, I was teaching for like ten years. Early on into it, I thought, oh, maybe someday I wanna be a consultant. Pretty quickly, the teaching was about the teaching, of course, but it was also sort of a long-term play for future client, you know, sort of lead gen stuff. It's really turned out that way. Now people that took classes from me are executive directors, vice presidents of advancement, and, you know, have really soared in their careers and are now decision makers who can decide who to bring in as a consultant or an outside partner. That's been really rewarding and it's been really fun, you know, to be a mentor to them and and to see them just continue to rise and shine in their profession and in their career. Have you found that you've needed to adjust your rates? Did you initially set them too low or too high when you got started? Good question. I think like the adage that everybody is undercharging is probably true. I mean, I've definitely <laughs> increased my rates over the years. I'm not just a teacher or facilitator. I'm a huge student. And so I love learning and I gobbled up several books about how to be a consultant when I first started. And one of those was the most awful title. I felt like I needed to like hide the jacket, you know, it was called million dollar consulting. And it felt totally obnoxious to be reading that book, (laughs) you know, in there, he talks about project based pricing versus hourly. And so I've never charged by the hour, but I have increased my rates. What's your onboarding process for clients? Is there a discovery meeting? Or what's that like? Something I've done within the last year is I created a new client welcome packet and explains a lot of what it's like to work with us and answers a lot of questions about you know how to reach us, how we run our meetings, who to contact about what. We also get them set up with the systems and tools that we use, which are Google Drive and Asana Project Management. And then we schedule a kickoff meeting and create a very detailed work plan that guides our work. I'm obsessed, you know, and sort of feel like there's this meta modeling that's happening. The way that we do things is a way for us to model the way that we recommend them do things with donors and within their own businesses. So I also send a welcome gift to everybody because I want to make sure they feel appreciated. And then actually getting a client to actually sign up with you. What's your kind of sales picture, your conversations you have prior? Really depends on, you know, how they came to us. One thing that I've developed and learned over the years is that some clients or some folks come not knowing exactly what they need. It's just that they know they need something. I have a sheet called a project scoping sheet, and it's a list of questions. So the first step is just a list of these questions on a sheet. Then I say, how about you look these over, talk these over with 
the folks on your team that need to be involved. And then think about the answers to these questions and get them back to me. So many people have shared that just the very nature of being asked these questions and going through that exercise is helpful in and of itself, that we're already sort of adding value and helping them. If they still kind of can't sort it all out, then that's a place where we do a sort of a diagnostic or an ag, you know an assessment process as the first step. The more that we've gotten clear about the kinds of projects that we tend to take on, capital campaigns, feasibility studies, case writing, board retreats, you know, these kind of our core services, I'm less inclined to take on things that are kind of out there that, that aren't really one of those. Mm-hmm. Now with capital campaigns, does that type of work limit the amount of projects you can take on, are those more overwhelming than some of the other projects you'll you'll do? Great question. Over the last year, we've gone from Varga Consulting, which was just me, to the Varga Group, which is you know more than just me, that there's eight of us now. That was an intentional pivot so that our core service is around capital campaigns now. Our sort of secondary but loved also services are retreats and um, training and the coaching and the board development. So yes, before that pivot, probably had probably between 12 and 16 clients at any given time, different kinds of work that we were doing. And now we're down to maybe between eight and 10. With pricing, uh, capital campaigns being a huge focus, is that, you you mentioned you, you were exploring and going down paths that were more profitable. Is the sales pitch a lot easier for capital campaigns being you're raising, say, $10 million and there's clear benefit there for the organization? Yeah. So I did do a very in-depth analysis of the different kinds of things that I was doing prior to this pivot relative to their profitability. The clear winner was Capital Campaign Council. The clear loser was teaching, you know, all this adjuncting, right? And so that was really hard, you know, because I love doing that. I think people enjoyed, you know, my teaching. And so So yeah, so that was hard. There's not as many people who can and teams that can do full service capital campaign work. And in my sort of regional area, one of the things that I noticed was that there's two large firms that do community-based capital campaigns. There's the higher education institutions that are never going to hire me or any other small boutique firm because they're going to go with the national folks. But beyond that, the people who do capital campaigns are individuals. So they can't bring the suite of services. They don't do prospect research and foundation grant writing and case writing and design and all of the sort of strategy work like I could do with my small-ish team. And all the people are going to retire, you know, in the next 10 years that are doing that work. There's lots and lots of young, younger consultants doing all sorts of fundraising consulting, but there's not that many. There's probably like six people locally here that in Oregon that do capital campaign consulting. They're all a lot older than me and it's really profitable. So it's get ticked off a lot of boxes and I like doing it. I mean, there's really nothing like seeing a project from a concept to reality. Yeah. And with certain buildings, you can say, Hey, I helped contribute to having that finished. And I have a weird inside hack for being good at capital campaign fundraising. My husband is a project manager, oversees construction relationships for a very large contractor. And so what's great for me about that, my clients, is that when I'm looking at capital campaign plans, I can look at the capital, like the actual construction plans and make sense of them and see if they're realistic and if the timing is realistic and I can actually help them sort of on the financing and the the modeling on the project side, not just on the fundraising side. And that I think is a little bit unique. And my husband's helped me learn a lot. And that's been kind of a fun thing too. Yeah, that sounds like an invaluable piece of knowledge to have. Yeah. For managing your business, do you outsource any other work outside of accounting? I do. Probably the most important person to the success of my business, other than me, is my graphic designer. Everything I do, she touches in some way, including my website. And I never, ever give a client, you know, a Word document or anything like that. It's all highly designed and polished looking. Um, that branding Mm -hmm. And the design, it's made an incredible difference to me in winning clients. 
So she touches all my proposals, my reports, my website, my social media images, handouts, everything. It's made me be able to compete with larger firms and win business over them. I also have an IT person. I have help with content marketing and and social. And do you do most of the writing yourself or there's now eight consultants? Uh, Is there someone that specializes in the writing? I do all the writing. It's actually something I really love to do. I get up really early in the morning and that's my kind of writing time. It's one of the things I really love to do. And what's your approach to your monthly newsletter that goes out? It's changing. You know, I'm launching this new content, you know, larger content strategy. So what's been rolled out has been a kind of a goodie bag. Mm -hmm. So we have a bunch of links and handy tools. I like to find things that are, I think are highly related to fundraising, but might not seem obviously related to fundraising. One example of that would be a thoughtful article about the art of conversation that has really nothing to do directly with fundraising. But in my mind, it really is everything to do with fundraising. That's been my approach to all my writing is I don't believe that the world needs another how-to or a listicle. And that's not really my approach or like perspective on fundraising and board development. So I tend to sort of connect dots between things that maybe aren't as obvious. And do you utilize any social media networks to promote your business? Yes. So Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and I have a Facebook page, but it is sad. And that's something I'm trying to change for the future. Has any of those proven to be the most valuable to you? The clear winner is LinkedIn. It's funny. I get so much positive feedback from people saying something like, I love everything you post on LinkedIn, or I follow you on LinkedIn. I love everything that you <laughs> You put up there and I do my own LinkedIn. So I know exactly what goes up there because I'm doing it. It's just interesting to see that that really resonates with people. Yeah. How much of your work is done on site with the client versus at your own offices? Well, there's sort of all of the like working on your business, right? Mm -hmm. There are all the things that you do to develop your business and your marketing. I mean, that's all done in the office. I would say 70% of the work I'm meeting with clients is on site with the client because there's all sorts of like analysis and writing reports and, you know, writing case copy and, and those kinds of things. I have shifted and it's been interesting, you know, again, on that line of thinking around profitability, I have started to shift to doing more phone, you know, or Google Hangout calls, even for local clients. And I was worried that that would feel less personal or be less productive in some way. But it's been great. And people have been really receptive to it. And so I've started to shift more in that direction. Awesome. Yeah. And kind of going off that with different tools and apps and services you use, what do you tend to use for managing projects or writing or, you know, everything and anything? I'm a Google Drive person. So that's where all of the folders are and both my business folders and also client-based folders. I think I mentioned earlier Asana. That's our project management tool. That's what we use internally amongst all the team members. But then we also create project folders in there for clients. We have our tasks related to that. And then some clients want to be a part of that. And some of them have their own project management tools. We let them figure that out. The other stuff I use is Hootsuite, you know, for social media. Mile IQ is probably the best app ever invented, I feel like. Put it on your phone and it just knows when you're driving around at all times. What I do is at the end of the month, I go back through my calendar and you you swipe left for business and right for personal. And so I do that and it just keeps track of all my mileage for me. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And then I use Tiny Scanner, which is also a phone based app that allows me to scan things and send them to people. And then last question before the lightning round, what's your typical schedule like? So I get up really early. So I get up and I work from like 515 to 645 in my home office. Then I turn into mom and I drive my kids around and get them going, you know, Mm -hmm. to school. Usually I would say many days a week, I then go work out afterwards. And then I put in sort of client hours or work hours until about 2.45, turn back into mom, (laughs) drive around, (laughs) drive around the activities a lot. And then usually in the night time after my kids have gone to sleep, 
I just sort of triage my email for mm -hmm. a half an hour, something like that, just to see what's going on. But every day is different. That's sort of the general gist of it. This episode is brought to you by us here at MarketSmart and Engagement Fundraising by Greg Warner. In this quick break, I want to remind everyone to go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to download the Engagement Fundraising audiobook for free. This offer is only available to listeners of the podcast. It's our way of saying thank you for listening and we really hope you enjoy the book. Once again, go to imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to take advantage of this promotion available only to listeners of the podcast. Now back to the episode. And with that, let's get to the lightning round series of quick questions and answers. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Don't quit. Take the long view and niche in. What book would you recommend to those getting started? I have four. Flawless Consulting, Million Dollar Consulting, Book Yourself Solid, and Essentialism. What's your favorite personal productivity habit? Getting up early. What's the best under $100 purchase you've made in the last month or so? You know, I have a really killer new pair of pajamas. I'm in love with them. <laughs> <laughs> your favorite monthly service or subscription you're signed up for? Pandora. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? I played Division One sports in college. What uh, sport? I played softball. I was a catcher. Nice. A desk or car, what would you clean first? My desk is always clean. It's super annoying. So I would definitely clean my car. Tea or coffee? Definitely tea. I don't even drink coffee. What do clients never ask you that you wish they did? That people don't ask me for references. I'm shocked at how many people and how many organizations never ask or check references. What's the most common error you see nonprofits make? That they think that fundraising is about them. My strong sort of belief is that donors don't give to organizations because of the organization's mission, but that they give to organizations because of theirs. And so not tuning in and being curious about who their donors are and what they care about I think is the biggest mistake they make. What charities do you admire or support? You know, I love all of my clients, obviously, but personally, my husband and I like supporting organizations that help foster kids and our local furniture bank. But what I probably care the most about is giving directly to incredible leaders. So there's a woman, as an example, who's a teacher in Mississippi that is just doing incredible things in her classroom. And so I just give directly to her. And where can people find more information about your services? You got it. You can come check our new website out. It's thevargagroup.com, which is the V-A-R-G-A group.com. Got a new ebook about money beliefs on there you can grab. Lots of free resources. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Amy Varga and also on Instagram at the Varga Group. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy, for your time today. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of How I Built My Funders and Consultancy presented by MarketSmart. If you like the show, make sure to review it in Apple Podcasts and pass it along to a colleague. I also wanted to remind everyone to visit imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer to download the Engagement Fundraising audiobook for free. Once again, that's imarketsmart.com slash exclusive dash podcast dash offer. Thanks for listening.